So good morning, everybody. I hope you're having an awesome Tuesday. And I know you guys are eagerly anticipating tonight's midterm. So you can demonstrate just how proficient you are in fluid mechanics. And, you know, I can't wait to see how well y'all will do. But first, today, we're going to jump into a discussion on, <clears throat> I don't know what I would call this, restricted flow, flow past objects. It's really looking at a, concepts associated with drag, terminal velocity, packed beds, and fluidized beds. So with that, I'll jump over to our notes. And we can go ahead and get started. Do you guys have a preference for color? Figure if, if we'd like, we can always break out of the traditional black. We should do green. Do green today. Green, green actually pops pretty well. All right, flow past objects. So the first um, topic in this section that we're going to be jumping into is looking at the concept of drag force and drag. So we can equate and define drag force as a resistive force in the direction of flow. exerted by the fluid. On a solid object. So if I was going to have my typical flow through a pipe. Now let's say I have just kind of a sphere. In the flow field here, I'll make it gray. It's like a rock, really smooth rock. And I wanted to describe the fluid as it flows. The fluid would be forced to move around that object. And as the fluid changes directions, it exerts a shear stress on the object that can be quantified by a drag force. And so the fluid exerts a drag force in the direction of flow on the object. And by Newton's third law, the object exerts a drag force opposing the flow direction. And so I would say the object a reactive force on the fluid in the direction opposite of flow. And so we can quantify this drag force, F sub D, as a quantity C sub D times rho times U squared times A sub P over 2, where C sub D is our drag coefficient. which we'll talk about how to define here in a second. Rho is our fluid density. U is our fluid velocity. And AP is what we call the projected area. And so the projected area is essentially, when I look at the object of interest in the direction of the flow field, what would be the two-dimensional shadow cast by that object in the flow field? So if I'm looking at a sphere, that projected area would be a circle. And so for spheres, The projected area 
is simply pi times the diameter of that particle of interest over four. And for non-spheres, area is, it's really width times the diameter of the particle. For example, if I had, what else can I have in a flow field? Let's look at a couple of more examples. Now let's say I had like a catalyst pellet. It was like a cylinder. And I had the same pellet, but now it's laid sideways in the flow field. So my fluid's like really annoyed. All right, my flow field follows this type of behavior. The projected area I would expect to see for these two objects will be different primarily because the orientation that they exist in, in the flow field. And so for this one, the projected area would be this height h times the diameter of the pellet, or the little catalyst. For this one, the projected area would be the circle, or pi times the diameter of the pellet squared. So you guys kind of understand the implications of looking at the projected area in these systems. All right, judging by your silence, I will say, assume that you say, yes, you kind of get it, you like it, it works really well. So if we can calculate drag force from this expression in terms of uh, drag coefficient, fluid density, fluid velocity, projected area, we can generally come up with the density, velocity, and uh, particle area. The more difficult part is looking at our drag coefficient, which rearranging our drag force expression, we, if we wanted to solve for drag coefficient, we could say it was two times the drag force over to fluid density times the fluid velocity squared times the projected area. Now, what we often find out is that the drag coefficient is a function of an object's sphericity, which we denote phi, and the Reynolds number around our particles. And phi here is sphericity, which just describes how sphere-like our particle is. With a sphericity of one, then we can say it, it's an exact sphere. Anything less than one, we say it has a more abnormal shape. We can calculate the sphericity by this expression. Six times V sub P divided by A sub S times D sub P, where V sub P is the volume of the particle. A sub S is the surface area of our particle. And D sub P would be our diameter, effective diameter. And it's also known as a characteristic length. You'll see a lot of, we'll talk in terms of characteristic length a lot of times, especially when we get into heat transfer. So to find drag force, we have to often find our drag coefficient, which is a, typically a function of two, these two values. 
Now, we can also get an idea in terms of the dependence of drag coefficient on Reynolds number, keeping in mind the Reynolds number is a little different when we're looking at restricted flow. We can calculate it by this in terms of the superficial mass velocity times the diameter of the particle or characteristic length over the flow viscosity or the fluid superficial velocity times the density of the fluid times the characteristic length over the viscosity. So with this in mind, we can look at and interpret this figure, which is figure 7.3 in your textbook on page 158. And this denotes and describes the influence of Reynolds number, which is in the x-axis. Sorry, I kind of cut that off with uh, the drag coefficient on the y-axis. So for a given, you know, regular shape, all you really need is the Reynolds number to estimate the drag coefficient. A couple of things you'll, you'll note is that at low Reynolds number, we can, we see a, a, a pseudo exponential dependence. And then after, at about a thousand, the drag coefficient largely levels off. When and then at high Reynolds number, we have this interesting dip, which we'll talk about here in a second. So as kind of the, the general rules of thumb, we can say a few things. One, for low Reynolds numbers, we can apply an equation known as Stokes law, which sets the drag force can be approximated by three pi mu u naught times the characteristic length. You can't see your Lopez, are you writing? Yes, I am, sorry. I think you're fine. All right, so for low Reynolds number, we can apply Stokes law which states that the drag coefficient, drag force, excuse me, can be calculated by the expression three pi mu times u times d sub p. And what this is really stating is that viscosity is a dominating factor. And shear. Well, then that's what we would typically expect at low Reynolds number, right? That the viscosity dependence, um, you know, overtakes um, that with the velocity squared as we would typically assume. And, you know, applying this expression along with um, our other drag coefficient expression, we can state that we can approximate our drag coefficient by the expression 24 over the Reynolds number. And this is typically for Reynolds numbers less than one. Now, as we get into out of this range, Reynolds number between one and a thousand, we find that our drag coefficient can be approximated by 18 times our Reynolds number to the negative 0.6. And then we consider this to be, you know, a form of transition flow with 
this being considered a form of laminar flow. And so that these Reynolds numbers for these flow regimes change when we're talking about restricted flow. And between about 1,000 and 200,000, we consider that turbulent flow. And the good news about this is we can approximate a Reynolds number as a constant value, which we saw in that figure 7.3, it being flat. Now, I also stated that there was a, there exists, a dip in our drag coefficient at high Reynolds numbers. And the graph showing that hitting about just over 300,000. So I'll say greater than 300,000. So why do you think there is a dip or a reduction of our drag coefficient at high Reynolds numbers? And you don't have to answer immediately. You can take a little bit of time to think about it. Anyone have any ideas? Well, it has to do with the form of the boundary layer and the wake that exists in the flow field. So at moderately high, reasonably turbulent flow, we can expect the flow to move around the system like this, which creates a, an area of essentially negative pressure behind the object. So what we see is, is a wake formation. And that results in a lot of energy dissipation and shear uh, within the, the flow system. At high enough Reynolds numbers, what we find is that the fluid momentum carries the fluid further inland, inward, at the back of our objects of interest. And what we see is a change in the boundary layer separation point and a decrease in the size of the wake that exists behind the object, as well as a reduction of drag. And so we see a reduction of drag Under a boundary layer separational shift. And so CD goes from 
0.44. We would say for Reynolds numbers greater than 300,000, we could estimate CD down to about 0.1. So it moves from about 0.44 down to 0.1, which is a considerable decrease in our drag coefficient and resulting drag. Now it's interesting because through proper design of our solid objects, we can take an advantage of this. of this drag reduction. Where do you guys think this might be beneficial? In terms of manipulating this flow field to reduce drag. You guys are just real talkative today. Well, a good example of this is in sports. Particularly, um, the best example I always say is golf. Primarily, if you think about a golf ball, how is a golf ball designed? Got the small indentions. Yeah, so it's it's full of a lot of uh, you know, indentions, inclusions. I promise this isn't a chocolate chip cookie. Right? And, and the design of those indentions is to encourage a minimal wake formation behind the golf ball as it, you know, flies through the air. And this was originally discovered uh, back when golf balls originally uh, used to be perfectly smooth. And golfers found that a worn-in ball that had a bunch of dings and dents from play tended to go much farther than, you know, brand new golf balls. And it was determined because due to these inclusions and imperfections, it encouraged a minimal wake and a reduced drag on our system. You also see this in baseball, right? A baseball is, isn't perfectly smooth, right? It has the stitching and the stitch work, you know, serves a similar purpose in that it creates just enough of an imperfect, you know, wake to reduce the drag as it moves through the air. Any questions on that so far? Does it reduce the drag in front of the ball or behind the ball? It primarily reduces the drag behind the ball. All right. And, and, and for, to, from the perspective of you have a smaller wake, and so you have a lot less energy dissipation and energy and essentially drag that exists on the backside. You can't really do a whole lot in terms of the front. And that's, that's more aerodynamics rather than this, which is, is a similar application, right? Similar manipulation. That's, that's basically figuring out how to minimize the fluid distortion to minimize drag. But this is more manipulation to minimize the, the wake formation that exists. All right, with that in mind, I forgot we're doing green today. The next thing I want us to consider is terminal velocity. 
So now I'm, let's say I take my golf ball and I hit it way up high, but I'm really, really, really bad at golf. So it just went straight up. And I know it's about to fall straight down. So for this object, what forces do I expect to be exerted as it falls in the air? Good gravity. What? Uh, so you've got gravity acting uh, down. All right, so we got, this will be a colorful day. Force due to gravity, what else? Air resistance acting in the opposite direction. Yeah, so we have our drag force in the opposite direction. So then the question is, how can we write a momentum slash force balance to describe the, the ball? falling due to gravity. So short answer is, I want you guys to take a minute or two to do it. So I'm gonna shoot you all into breakout rooms for about three minutes to see, to have you guys discuss and see what you guys can come up with in terms of a momentum balance good practice for. The exam. So good luck. See you all in a couple minutes.
All right. How did it go? Do we have an idea, guess, an answer for our momentum balance? All right, nobody? I think we may have an answer. All right, what, what did your group come up with? So we have the drag coefficient in the positive. It's positive because it's going up. All right. And then we have minus mass times gravity. Okay. Plus density, velocity squared times area for Newtons. And then our restoring force. But would it have a restoring force? In this case, if I'm honest, you would really only have these two forces involved. And this would be equal to your momentum accumulation for your system. Which, as we've defined previously, we would say is the mass times our change in velocity with respect to time times our velocity times our change in mass with respect to time. Which there's no change in mass for the ball, assuming that it's going to hold up okay as it falls. And so what we're left with is our drag force, our gravitational force times mass times acceleration. Now our drag force we've already defined as our drag coefficient times our density. I'm gonna say a density of the fluid for reasons that I'll show in a second, times the velocity squared times the projected area over two. We already have our gravitational force, which is mass times gravity, which I can also state is the volume of our object, which if it's a sphere, it would be pi times the diameter cubed over six times the relative density, density of the solid minus density of the fluid over gravity. So this would be mass. And this, if, we're, if I'm really honest, it's looking at a comparison between kind of lumping in gravity and the buoyant force. So if you wanted to include the buoyant force, you could. It would also be technically true. However, it's just extremely small. So that's where that comes from. And so if I want to plug some of this in, I could say, well, C sub D, row F, U squared. Now the projected area is just going to be pi times D squared over four. So I can say that minus pi D cubed over six times row S minus row F times gravity equals pi D cubed over six times row S times area, or, sorry, that A is acceleration. So if I divide both sides by everything in front of acceleration, what I'd be left with is three times our drag coefficient, times the density of the fluid, times velocity squared, divided by four times diameter times the density of the solid minus density of solid minus density of the fluid divided by density of the solid times gravity equals area. So if I was gonna say solve for the acceleration as a, you know, a combination of all our forces, this is what we have. 
But if we're interested in terminal velocity, I can say that the velocity is equal to our terminal velocity when our acceleration is zero. And so by plugging in these two values, I am left with three times c sub d times rho f u sub t now squared over four d rho s equals rho s minus rho f over rho s times gravity. And then simply to solve for our terminal velocity, I just isolate my velocity and put everything under a square root. If I do that, I should be left with an expression that says the terminal velocity equals the square root of four times gravity times diameter times rho s minus rho f divided by three times our drag coefficient times rho f. Ugh, this pen. And this is what we have for the terminal velocity of our spherical object. Any questions on that calculation? Should there be a density S term in the denominator? Um, that's a good question, but if you notice here, um, the density S is in both denominators. So when I move them over, they'll cancel. Yep, no problem. So let's take a look at an example to help you guys kind of get a, an idea in terms of application of this terminal velocity. So let's say I have a spherical hot air balloon with a diameter of 40 feet and a deflated mass of 500 pounds going to be released from rest in air at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If the gas inside the balloon is now 200 degrees Fahrenheit, what is the terminal velocity of the balloon if our drag coefficient is 0.6? This is what my falling up problem. I'll give you a, a second to write some stuff down. All right. So let's take a look at this example together. <clears throat> so for this system, we've got a hot air balloon. Da -da -da. Got a little basket. And if you want, we can get the little firebox going, a little flame. The important part of any engineering problem is drawing it as accurately as you can. All person. Hey, Dr. Lopez, you're still on your PowerPoint. Well, it's going to be a surprise, but OK. You guys just love seeing the process. So now we got our hard air balloon. Everybody's having a wonderful time. We have to figure out, all right, for this system, what forces do we have? We have gravity, 
Now we have buoyant force moving it upwards, and we have our drag force moving it downwards. So by this, I would state that my buoyant force minus my drag force minus the force due to gravity should be equal to zero in this sense of a terminal velocity, which I can solve for my buoyant force and gravity based off of the information provided. That being, oh, here, I'll make this green. I stated that the diameter of the balloon is 40 feet. The density inside was, or excuse me, the temperature on the inside is 200 degrees F. The temperature on the outside is 50 degrees F. And the deflated mass is 500 pounds. And the drag coefficient as it flies was 0.6. It's pretty reasonably sized balloon. So I need to find my buoyant force as well as my force due to gravity. So my buoyant force is going to be essentially the density of the fluid displaced times the volume of the fluid displaced. My force due to gravity is going to be my deflated mass plus the density of the air on the inside times the volume of the air on the inside. So this would be air on the outside. So I need two different densities to do this calculation. So to find the density on the outside, I need the pressure times the molecular weight over R times the temperature on the outside. To find the density on the inside, I need the same thing, but with a different temperature. So if I'm gonna stick to English units, the pressure it was going to be about 14.7 psi. The molecular weight of air is 29 pounds per pound mole. R for this case would be 10.73 psi cubic feet per pound mole degree R. And outside I have what 50 degrees. That's what I said. Is that correct? Which should be approximately. What is that in Rankin? 510. So I get about 0 0.0779 pounds per cubic feet for the density on the outside, for the density of the fluid on the inside, I should expect a lower density. PSI, cubic feet per pound mole, degree R. That's 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 660 degrees Rankin. I get 0 0.060 pounds per cubic feet. So what would you like to solve first, the buoyant force or the force due to gravity? <laughs> 
All right, let's solve for the buoyant force. So I have rho on the outside times the volume. So for this, I'm going to assume uh, a volume of a sphere. And so I'm going to say the density is 0.0779 pound mass per cubic feet times pi times 40 feet cubed over six. So if I do that calculation, I get two. 1610 pound mass for my buoyant force. Now that's actually, I need to also multiply times gravity over d sub c times g over g sub c. That magically becomes a pound force. I'll clean that up. 2,610 pound force. Now for the force due to gravity. I know my deflated mass is 500 pound mass. And I got to add the density on the inside times its volume, which is 0 0.060 pound mass per cubic feet. times pi 40 feet cubed over six times g over g sub c. And that will give me my value in pound force. So I do that calculation. I get 2,510 pound force due to gravity, which tells me if I'm solving for my drag force, then I have 2,610 pound mass force minus 2,510. Funny how that worked out. So, my drag force is approximately a hundred pound force. And since I know my drag force is equal to my drag coefficient times the density, on the outside velocity squared times the area over two. For this problem, I can say my terminal velocity is equal to the square root of two times my drag force divided by drag coefficient, density on the outside times the projected area, which is pi d squared over four. So this makes this an eight. Or terminal velocity is equal to square root of eight times 100 pound force, which I need to get rid of the pound force term. So I multiply times 32.2 .2 pound mass feet for pound force second squared divided by a drag coefficient, which was 0.6 divided by the density on the outside, which was 0 0.0. What did I say it was 779? 779 pound mass per cubic feet times pi times the diameter squared or 40 feet squared. If you want, we can do a quick unit check. The pound force goes away, the pound mass goes away here. I'm left with feet squared. And then I have feet squared on the top. Because, yeah.
So if I take the square root of feet squared per second squared, I'm left with feet per second. And so my terminal velocity should be about 8.8 .8 feet per second. Any questions on that? All right, then let's move on and talk a little bit about flow through a packed beds. So in a system, now let's say I've got packed bed in my flow path. If you want, we can say it's a catalyst packed bed, whatever you'd like. My system's coming in at a certain pressure with a certain velocity. It's leaving at an, uh, another pressure at another velocity. So the question I have for you guys is what do we expect to happen to our pressure drop due to the presence of the packed bed? So as compared in terms of unrestricted versus restricted or obstructed flow. What do you guys think will happen to our pressure drop in this system? Wouldn't it increase? You are correct. The pressure drop will increase. So my next question then for us to consider, what factors are critical in calculating our pressure drop through our packed bed? What do you think are some of the things we need to know? The size of the pellets. All right, so we need to know pellet size or packing size. What else? The void fraction. The void fraction is important. What else may be important? I'm assuming the uh, length of the packed bed 
That's true. The packed bed length is important. The density of the fluid. All right, fluid density. Anything else? There's a couple other things we'll, we'll uncover as we get there. So a couple things we also have to consider. When it comes to packing size, now we've also already mentioned sphericity is important when it comes to flow past objects. <clears throat> And so sphericity will definitely come into play. What will also come into play in our system is the effective flow diameter. Which can be calculated as d sub e is equal to four times epsilon over a sub v one minus epsilon. Where this epsilon is our void fraction. And a sub b is a ratio of the particle areas over the volume of the particle. And this, here, let me change this. It shouldn't be A sub P. Remember, this is the surface area, not the projected area. So I just want to confirm that. And so if we look at pressure drop through a packed bed, we can come up with the following expression that says the delta P or pressure drop is equal to three times our friction factor times the fluid density times its viscosity, velocity squared, excuse me, times the flow length divided by the sphericity of the particle over the particle's diameter or characteristic length times the quantity one minus epsilon over epsilon cubed. If we wanted to rearrange this expression, we would find that if we lumped the majority of the terms together like this, we would get essentially delta P and all the stuff is equal to three times our friction factor. 
which is important for a couple reasons, primarily because what do we say happens to our friction factor at high Reynolds number? Then it's near constant. Yeah, it becomes constant. So it uh, becomes yeah. constant. And a high Reynolds. And so we can say for fully turbulent systems, that, that value essentially becomes a constant as well. And so what we can do is we can add a correction factor for laminar flow or laminar contribution to the expression. And say that delta P times phi times the diameter of the particle times epsilon cubed minus one minus epsilon rho u squared L is equal to that 1.75 plus 150 over our Reynolds. Where for a packed bed, the Reynolds number is approximately rho times our superficial velocity times our characteristic length or diameter times sphericity divided by one minus epsilon. Uh oh, I broke the simulation. One minus epsilon times our viscosity. So it means, you know, mathy term, right, all this stuff in terms of characteristics of the equation exists in terms of a laminar contribution, or excuse me, a laminar contribution. And a turbulent flow contribution. Now, if we combine everything back together, throw in the Reynolds number, as well as get put all the mathy term variables on the right-hand side, to simply solve for pressure drop, and by extension, frictional dissipation, in terms of a frictional dissipation, or fancy F, which is a delta P over rho, what we end up with is an equation where we have 150 U mu L, one minus epsilon squared, over sphericity squared times the fluid density, times the diameter of the particle squared, times Void fraction cubed plus 1.75 u squared L times one minus epsilon divided by sphericity diameter of the particle times void fraction cubed. Where this is an important equation. So I'll do all my circling, which I'm sure there's a high chance that Adams introduced it the Ergon equation, which essentially defines frictional dissipation th through a packed bed, where we have our laminar contribution here. So I say this is the laminar portion, and our turbulent contribution is here. Now what that means is if you're at sufficiently high or sufficiently low enough Reynolds numbers, you can neglect one of these two terms. And what we end up with are simplified expressions or pressure drop through a packed bed. So I would say at low, Reynolds number. Make sure I've got 
the names in the right order. We can look at the Blake Cosney equation. which simply says that F is equal to delta P over rho, which is equal to 150 U mu L, one minus epsilon squared over spy squared times rho times diameter of the particle squared epsilon cubed. And at high Reynolds numbers, we can use the Burke Plummer equation, which states that F is equal to delta P over rho, which is equal to 1.75 times U squared L, one minus epsilon over phi, diameter of the particle, epsilon cubed. And so considering both laminar and turbulent flow, you can use the full ergon equation. If you're at sufficiently low or sufficiently high Reynolds number, you can approximate it using either the Blake Cosney or the Burke Plummer equation, depending on which flow regime and the Reynolds number that you have. We can visualize these three expressions. by this figure, which shows you a dimensionalized, dimensionless pressure drop as a function of both the Ergon equation as well as the Blake Cosney and the Burke Plummer. And so what we find is that for Reynolds numbers typically below 10, the Blake Cosney provides a pretty reasonable approximation for what we expect in terms of pressure drop for Reynolds numbers above about a thousand. The Burke Plummer provides a reasonable explanation. And for all things in between, we typically have to rely on the Aragon equation. Any questions on that? All right, if not, I think that's a good stopping point for today. There's not, the next thing that I was gonna jump into as an example, there's no point introducing it right now. But I think that's um, a good amount of material. On Thursday, we'll wrap up our discussion on uh, packed beds, we'll work an example, and we'll also talk about fluidized beds and how they differ from packed beds and how our equations shift when we're looking in those systems. But that's all I have. Thank you all for coming. Um, take care. And I will see you hopefully tonight for your midterm. Good luck. And if you need anything, feel free to send me a last email. email. I'll try to um, take a look, but no, no promises. Um, all right. Dr. Lopez. Yes. What is void fraction? That's a good question. Void fraction is essentially the amount of void space that exists within the packed bed. So okay. the, more, the more dead space between the packing, the higher the void fraction. So it's, it's a dimensionless um, quantification of packing density. Thank you, Dr. Right. Lopez. You're welcome. Take care, guys. Um, Alyssa, um, I'll jump over to office hours if you want to ask your question. So okay. let's, we'll jump over to that, that move. Okay. All right.